am Kat Harris. Uh, I'm one of the ladies who Lego, and uh, for a Brick Fair 2018 in Virginia, I've made Diagon Alley. Um, obviously, it's the uh, 20th anniversary of the first book coming out. Uh, Harry Potter's birthday is on July 31st, so with Brick Fair beginning on August 1st for the exhibitors, it was perfect timing. And then, obviously, we've also had the uh, Lego release of all the new Harry Potter and Fantastic Beasts set, so pretty much timing was perfect. I started working on this in the fall. I definitely wanted to make it feel like Diagon Alley in terms of, uh, you know, the path that kind of wins through uh, a regular Muggle city. So I tried to keep with a very, you know, grid-like standard modular, quote, Muggle world um, as the backdrop and then create a lot of whimsy and movement and bustle feeling um, throughout the street. I think one of the most um, important things was trying to balance sight lines but also keep that condensed private feel. So originally I had uh, Nocturne Alley behind Diagon Alley, but obviously when you're talking about displaying something, you want to make sure that it's actually visible. I know that's, let's be real, the definition of the word display. So um, I ended up moving uh, Nocturne Alley to be on the forefront, but still hopefully give it a little bit of a hidden feel in and of itself. I felt it was more important to both display the buildings that I personally liked, um, but also the ones that were a little bit more integral to the story. So even though the Cauldron Shop was maybe technically the first building after the uh, Leaky Cauldron, it, it really didn't have a lot going on in terms of how it played into the overall story plot, so I felt comfortable moving it. So there were a lot of give and take opportunities in terms of you know what, what you're remaining true to. So each building, I made basically judgment calls on whether or not I would draw more from uh, the book, more from my own imagination, more from you know the movies or Universal and how different aspects of um, the canon and things like that were represented. So uh, you know, book was always kind of top priority, uh, and then in my never-ending arrogance, my own imagination was probably second, <laughs> and then came the movies <laughs> and other aspects. Um, so obviously, you know, you, when you get into Diagon Alley, the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to find the Leaky Cauldron. So, well, I'll actually, I'll actually take that back because the night bus, you can take a night bus ride to Diagon Alley. So we'll consider that as part okay. of it. That's a good so. Um, <laughs> so uh, the night bus was a little bit of a challenge. Obviously, there's not much you can do in terms of making it different than the set. I mean, it's a, giant, it's a purple bus. I wanted it to balance in terms of size, maybe a little bit larger than the night bus sets, but maybe not quite as big as something like the London bus. Like I still wanted it to fit in um, with, the, with the smaller scale uh, buildings that I do. Um, I also wanted to bring some of that magic element to it. So I thought it was really important that it had some sort of like movement to it, or you could kind of see that it wasn't just a purple bus. Um, so what I did is on the top and the bottom, it, it basically slides. So Can it's you give an example side. of that? Yeah. So it'll probably be easier to do it maybe on this, okay. since this is our little display area. So basically as you go through, it can kind of just slide to weave in and out of muggle traffic. <laughs> That's a very useful feature for a bus to have. Yeah, I think so, you know, especially when muggles can't see you. I think probably for uh, insurance purposes, it's much better. Um, now, I in this build, I realized that one of the things I hate the most is putting out figs. So I didn't end up putting any inside the bus. Um, but you can see I tried to bring in some elements. There are luggage carriers. You can see that the chandeliers will move a little bit. They're on uh, Technic bars, so they don't move too quickly. But they will move just like in the movie and just like described in the book. So. One of the things that I noticed is as I did these interiors, you get a little bit of bowing between these two segments. So it's really important that I put these slides on the bottom so that you're able to have a nice smooth motion as you move. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. So that's, I mean, without even getting to the buildings, I already love that design there and the way that came together. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, trial and error and at the end of the day, I'm happy with it. Uh, you know, as long as you can see that, that it can move, I think that that's usually enough. And then, of course, the next question is, when are you going to make one that you can pull up, like in the movie? And I'm like, uh, come on, can never win. <laughs> People always want more, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, right? 
Um, so then obviously once you get off the night bus, then you can go into the leaky cauldron. So I tried to keep it in like a back street kind of feeling. Obviously you can see it's done in a standard uh, modular base plate size um, and it's set back a little bit from these kind of uh, facades that were created. Um, one of the challenges with this building is that you want to make it fit with both the kind of dollhouse style uh, that I've created with the Diagon Alley builds. I wanted them to feel like not only the original Diagon Alley sets, but I wanted them to be accessible. They have smaller footprints. Um, so when you do it on a floor by floor um, method of opening, similar to the modulars, it's, it's really hard on a smaller building to be able to see all that detail. So I really thought it was important to have some sort of dollhouse style. That being said, hinges on the outside mean that you can't have a, a flush uh, modular connection. So what I had to do is create a specialty hinge for this so that it was able to open in the way that would, would still allow it to have a completely flush back. So you have to pull it out and then it'll open. So you're able to have that opening, the dollhouse style that you want, but also it's compatible with uh, standard LEGO, Lego modulars. And then all sorts of fantastic details. You want to point out some of your, your favorites in there? Um, so I think you know, one of the, the biggest elements is I wanted this to feel like a traditional English pub. And, you know, when, when I think that, I think about, you know, archways and the rounded booths with kind of the old, worn, dark colors. Um, so I really tried to integrate that with the booths. And then I just did a table and a bar, obviously, going with the first movie and first book. First storyline, this is how he enters the magical world. He sees Quirrell in here. He sees some other people who are excited to finally meet Harry Potter. And, you know, it's true, it's true. He's back, he's around. Um, and then I was very fortunate to get a couple of the new Harry Potter CMF figs so that I was able to incorporate that pink umbrella. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some fantastic figs in that new series. What's your thought on that uh, overall? Were you, were you impressed with some of those? I was. I think like most people, you know, the, the medium-sized legs that move, amazing, especially when you're talking about creating a display. You're able to really build that movement, that animation that, you know, you want to be a part of your mocks, especially when you're, you're focused on storytelling. Um, for, for me personally, you know, in this, this build, it was a little bit of a challenge. I just don't need that many Hogwarts-related people. Um, but that being said, a lot of the outfits were very helpful and I didn't incorporate a lot of the figs in there just so that you know people who had just purchased them or were looking forward to it were able to see those characters that they were excited about. Um, obviously the new skirt pieces are very interesting. I like those and I like um, honestly the shape in the back I could take it or leave it. Um, I'm most excited for them being the proper height okay. um, because uh, previously all those skirt pieces were actually a little bit taller and, and it could make a little bit of an issue sometimes when you're, for instance, when I did the Madame Malkin's build, which we'll get to, um, it didn't quite fit in the window because I had used a mini fig versus, uh, you know, with the old style basic, you know, two by two slope. Right. Um, so, put this back, but you know, one of the essential elements here is that when you are finished in the leaky cauldron, you have to go back and you've got to get wand out and you have to tap a very specific brick and what that means is you want to have a moving wall um, so you have to show them that magic so it's really important that you have the opening brick wall because that's how you kind of get past into the Diagon Alley area so I, I really needed to incorporate that in some way again it took a couple of, of tries to get both a smooth movement but also something that was nice and hidden and fairly flush when you know it wasn't in use just because you wanted that effect especially watching you know, kids look at everything and then suddenly you put their fig in there and then open it and it, it just had a lot more impact. Yeah. So um, that was one of the, the larger hurdles. It's At the end of the day, it's a very simple mechanism. It's just a gear and then like the one by four. I'm not a technic person, so I don't know what it is. But you know, it's essentially a one by four plate, but with little gear things on it. <laughs> That's close enough. <laughs> where's, where's Kevin? I need him for my translator. He's, uh, he's my translator in terms of the technic mumbo jumbo. Um, so then moving along, the apothecary, it's not really a big um, feature in terms of the books and the story. Honestly, I just thought it would be kind of cool to make an apothecary. It's just something that inherently has a lot of interesting details on the inside. Um, obviously, without giving away any spoilers, I chose to put the new Moody fig there because he may or may not be mixing up some sort of potion uh, in order to maintain him and his plot. <laughs> That's all I'll say to that.
This one, again, I wanted to make it open up in a way that was a little bit fun and also easy to access and see some of the details. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know much about an apothecary, but it seems like there's probably a lot going on in there. You obviously need a lot of ingredients, so we've just got these built-in shelves. Additionally, I thought um, about the little, you know, the apothecary drawers that are very similar to the old style, like library cardstock drawers. Um, so I wanted to create a look that would mimic that. And then um, mortar, pestle, obviously mixing things up uh, was important too. All those bottles and everything on the back wall there are just fantastic. Yeah, that, that looks works really well for that look. Thank you. I had a lot of those extra black windows, so I thought they'd make nice little cabinet doors. Um, and then just kind of creating a lot of light reflection. Um, it's a little bit harder to see, but I don't know. For some reason, I think apothecary and I think about those older windows that are very inconsistent, uh, whether it's because someone has messed up a potion and something exploded at various points and they've all been replaced at different times. I don't know, but I use different uh, toned glass just to get a lot of that kind of uh, interest and, and reflection throughout all the bottles. So then I noticed the, the kind of brighter, pinker pieces that you had underneath there. Is that kind of, do you have each of those individually marked so you know where each building goes? That was the plan, and it stopped about right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, like I said, I, I had never actually laid all of this out before I showed up here. Um, and then I, I started to, on Sunday, lay out the basics. And at, at the end of the day, I realized I was going to be here in two days at Brick Fair, and there was just no point in going through all of that, labeling everything, yeah. and then hoping it panned out. So I just brought the tiles and the plates, and I figured, whatever, I'll just do it here. We've got enough time to set up. So I, I started off, as I normally do, uh, incredibly immaculate with my organization, and then it just deteriorated to chaos in, in a couple of days. So the, as The usual strategy yeah, there. I don't think that's in any way, shape, or form um, unfamiliar to any AFOL. So... You know, we've all got our incredibly uh, meticulous systems, and we organize so well, and we label, and then we don't, and that's how it goes usually. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, moving along, Owl Emporium, obviously, you know, Hedwig being beloved, you know, we had to do something really fun with the owls. Um, the exterior of this was just a lot of, you know, again, like anything, trial and error um, in terms of getting the shape. We tried out a couple different things. Uh, you know, I tend to gravitate towards symmetry. I didn't want anything wonky. I tried something like a hand holding a tilted cage. Um, and at the end of the day, I just think that this, it, it mimics almost a Victorian building, but obviously it has a little bit of whimsy to it. Um, the brick belt owl, obviously everyone loves Hedwig. It wouldn't have been a representation of Hedwig in actual Diagon Alley. Um, but, you know, those white owls, people just love to see them because everybody has such an emotional attachment to Hedwig. Um, so you really can't go wrong with it. Um, and this is any, you can kind of see on this build, any time that there was a Lego sticker or printed part or anything like that that I could utilize, I, I really tried to stay true to that. So I did use the owl sign from the uh, 2011 I believe it was, uh, Diagon Alley set. And then for things that, uh, you know, I needed to have a sign for Elops Owl Emporium. So I went ahead and just printed that at a home printer, like on a sticker paper. Um, so I wanted to have building names, but obviously you can't do everything with what has already been created by Lego. Uh, outside, I wanted to have some of the new owls mixed with some of the older, you know, ones. Same with on the inside. Inside, I can open it up. It's actually one of the more boring builds focus mostly on the outside for this. Uh, it's just more owls. Um, so, oops. Basically, I did some little owl pellets in there just to kind of, that's what people would need. And then I have a nice little, uh, what is it, coping with ornith ornithophobia? Is that what it is? Fear of birds. <laughs> just, uh, you know, those little kind of funny elements in there where you're just thinking, I don't know, how would it work out if, uh, you know, a wizard had this paranoia or fear of birds and suddenly they couldn't use the owl post? Like, how would they communicate with people and things like that? So um, I just thought that was a funny little way to incorporate it. Also, because I'm an AFOL and we love to kind of make our lives more difficult, a week before the show, I decided to expand the building because it was originally much skinnier. So not all of the original interior made it back in. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
moving right along. Obviously, it's important to have quality Quidditch supplies. Um, here's another example of some of the stickers that were created. I uh, just wanted to kind of keep that bustling, like, shopping alley feel. So I thought it was essential to have a lot of those signs. I wanted some outdoor stalls and vendors, as it was described in the book. And in the first book, Harry is walking by. You have all these kids who are so excited for the Nimbus 2000. Unfortunately, that just did not fit on that size tile, and I really wanted to use those tiles. So I went for Firebolt, which is a, the next kind of new and exciting room that came out, um, just because it fit a little bit better, and I have the kids out front who are very, very excited. Um, I did go through a lot of different options with, with how I wanted this snitch to feel. I wanted it to stick out enough, but not feel so imposing, obviously, next to the Owl Emporium, which has a very, very you know large kind of imposing uh, cage. I wanted something that felt very light because, you know, you think about the snitch, it's fast, it's hard to find. I didn't want it to be a huge part of it. Uh, also, I made this before the new sets were released and they had a little snitch accessory already. Um, so I had to do a brick belt. Looking inside, we've got some mannequins and different clothing options. And then here's where I was able to use a lot more of the tiles and stickers that were already created by LEGO. You've got the uh, cannons and the Quidditch poster that were from the original Burrow. You've got the Hogwarts crest. And then at some point it's mentioned that um, somebody's team that they support is the Tornadoes or something. So uh, I was able to use the Nexo tile to really you know, incorporate that as a pennant or something. Um, additionally, wanted to have a little shadow box with a snitch. So for that, I use the uh, microphone accessory. Yeah, that works really well for that. Thank you. So this one's nice and compact, but you know, you've got all the essentials in there. All right. So now as you move along, you've got all your fun stuff. Uh, now it's time for books. So you've got Flourish and Blots. Uh, this is a bookstore where you can get a lot of your books for uh, the Hogwarts school list. They have specifics that you need. Um, I went with more of a uh, basic interior. Um, as I develop this, if I, if I develop this, maybe I'll do the Guillory Lockhart kind of book signing scene. Not really sure, but I went with just a, a little bit more of a basic shopping experience on the inside for how the, the bookstore normally looks on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, just basic figs, shopping around, and then I did again try to incorporate a little bit of the, the storyline with the box of invisible book of invisibility up in the attic and you know the books may or may not be in there you don't really know <laughs> I love that chandelier the way you've, you've kind of stacked the trains clear pieces is really nice so I think that's very I think that's very common I'm pretty sure that I, I can't take credit for that because I think it's been done in a couple sets as well uh, with the one by two plates including I think the friends hotel was one of them I feel like another one too so I think that's more common than Either way, it probably wasn't my it wasn't my idea. <laughs> it fits well with the, yeah. this build, though. Thank you. Yeah, it feels very regal, and it's nice because it's got those nice tall windows in the front, and you can really you can see it and take advantage. Yeah, excellent. And then I know we, we've been focusing a lot on the the kind of interiors of these, but I mean the exteriors are wonderful as well. I love the different colors you've used here. They all have kind of a, a unique color palette, and so they stand out from one another very nicely. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think like like most people, I try to. I tend to gravitate towards the same kind of colors that I just personally like. I tend to like a lot of the dark greens. Obviously, like everybody, I love the teal, but you can't really build in it because there's not enough. Um, and I love the, the dark blues. And, you know, I'm not going to lie, a lot of my choices are based on the availability, not only within my own collection, but you'll see a lot of things that have been on the pick a brick wall. Um, at, at, at the end of the day, I build with what I have and what I have access to, and I think that that can kind of... Um, help me with, with keeping, uh, keeping my momentum going. If I have almost too many possibilities, it's lovely, but I don't want to be waiting and waiting on BrickLink orders or waiting and waiting on a new set to come out because it's a specific piece I want. Right. Um, you know, when I'm in the zone and I'm feeling it, I kind of want to just keep going. So I work with what I have and, and I had a lot of tan. So it worked well. <laughs> so if we keep moving down the line here, what do we have? So Magical Instruments was a kind of last minute. I Unfortunately, the interior for that isn't done. I just was able to keep the drum kit uh, in the window. Uh, but I was uh, able to get a lot going on out, 
outside. Obviously, there were a lot more printed available, like tiles, and there were a few stickers that I had. I'm a big fan of the Elves line, so I was able to use quite a few of those, uh, as well as some records from the, the standard. I think one of them was Monsters, and one of them was, I think I got at a Build-A-Mini, maybe. Uh, the harp was from an elf set, so I didn't actually create that design. It was perfect as is. You know, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. Like, I liked it. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't need to change that at all. Um, so, yeah, that's the magical instruments. And then this is the first example of uh, decal printing. So, ended up getting a decal cutter, I guess. I don't know if it's a decal printer or cutter. You can print and cut with it. So I ended up doing decals for some of these buildings, depending on what looked best. For something like Flourish and Blots, I wanted it to have a couple of layers behind the text. Uh, but for Magical Instruments, I wanted to incorporate that font that people are used to seeing in terms of Harry Potter. So I just made a decision on each building, depending on what aesthetically I wanted to see. Also, I wanted a Flitwick-looking character there, since a lot of people know him as conducting the orchestra in the movies. So I figured he's got to get a sheet music somewhere, right? Um, moving along, we've got Madame Malkins. Now, originally I was going to do Madame Malkins, as well as the, uh, the fancier clothing store, Twill Fit and Tattings, but... I didn't have time to do both, so I made Madame Malkins a little bit fancier just because I was in the fancy mood and I didn't want to uh, sacrifice that, mm -hmm. knowing that I couldn't do the building. So, <laughs> Have you had any uh, incidents so far moving the buildings in and out? Why didn't you wait till the end of the interview to ask that? <laughs> At least it'll be on camera, I guess. Um, no, so far so good. I mean, with all the crowded people in the street, a couple of figures have been knocked, ba knocked down, but having uh, this little kind of sub table to show kids and everything like that has been great. Yeah. Um, just because it, it limits all that extra interference. So when you open this one, I wanted to incorporate a lot of uh, outfit options. You know, they kind of advertise that you can get all your Hogwarts robes here. There's tailoring. Uh, this is one of the ones that I don't have the Harry figure in it. When Harry meets Malfoy and he's kind of that snotty boy getting his robes done and things like that. So I don't have it for this one, but I didn't really feel like it was essential. I have it on some of the other ones. I love, love, love this printed brick. I think just like everybody else uh, from the classic Bat Cave. So I, I had to get a couple of those. I also wanted some nice wood paneling. I ended up also in the apothecary, I did a similar look, but I used the uh, crates just to give a little bit of texture to the wood, but without detracting from the print. The mirrors, you know, that's obviously a very classic tailoring mirror. You need to kind of have that three-way. Now the edges are just random part of mirrored sticker sheets. I just found the edges of sticker sheets from my Disney castle, whatever it was, that could fit on a one by four. So, you know, ways not, want not. Even the outside of stickers are very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Stairs, I just hate stairs. <laughs> stairs and roofs, I feel like I just, I wish I could just mail somebody my mocks to do those. Uh, they just feel like such wasted real estate. So I did these very, very compact spiral staircase. Uh, it just, they don't add much to a story mm -hmm. overall. So I try to minim minimize the footprint. And then I used a lot of, uh, you can see up in the top, a lot of friends tiles for your kind of workshop look, as well as some capes. Now I have actual official Lego capes throughout the build, both in Madame Malkin's as well as around Diagon Alley. But we also have some custom ones that my sister, the other lady who Lego, uh, you see I did that, that <laughs> S that you can cut out later so that nobody gets in trouble. <laughs> uh, she was able to make these custom capes. You know, she's a little bit more handy than I am. She sews, so she had a lot of fabric on hand. So I, I just didn't really have enough capes in general, and we needed to do a couple more. So she was able to create those. Yeah, that's a very helpful skill to have when making this type of build. <laughs> certainly is, certainly is. It came, I mean, it was, it was going to get very expensive if we couldn't get extra capes. Yeah. So then, moving along, we have Gringotts. Obviously, um, it's one of the most iconic buildings, so it you know, had to be white, but you, you couldn't have it completely white, even though it's described as, as white. Uh, you know, I did a little bit of gold, 
Sand green, let's be real, everybody loves sand green. <laughs> it's just a great color. Um, and again, those tiles were on the pick-a-brick wall at one point, so I was able to grab them. Um, the biggest question that I got was, but where's the dragon on top? So in my fine, 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 I'll appease the audience, I put up a, a classic dragon so people would stop asking me about the dragon. Um, I mean, you're a bank, you've been around for 500 years, and one time a dragon pops out of your roof and suddenly that's all you're known for. So you got to give the people what they want. <laughs> yeah, apparently you're dragon bank now. You can't get away from it. Uh, so that was kind of my solution was, hey, People will love it. They'll know it's a dragon, but it, you know a lot of your Lego fans will look at it and say, "Oh yeah, that's the classic dragon. I love it. I love it." Um, so I'll grab this one. It's a little bit heavy. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, another way that I plan to head to appease people, I will not. I will not make it all crooked and wonky. So that was just not going to happen. Okay. I refuse to believe that. If Egyptians could build pyramids so well, with or without magic or aliens, that thousands of years later, goblins were unable to build a straight column, <laughs> period. I think they're very, very nitpicky. You know, they definitely are, you know, they like things the way they like. They have a lot of oversight. I mean, they, they take their business seriously, and I don't think they would have ever, ever accepted construction crew that would not make straight columns. I'm pretty sure there's some sort of leveling spell available. I just don't agree with the wonky look. So this, this is when my own uh, interpretation of the material definitely trumped anything that, you know, Universal did or any, anything like sure. that. So I just, I couldn't do it. It just hurt my soul too much. But again, to appease everyone, I, I did uh, give them an option, I guess you could say, of seeing the, the angled look. Okay. So similar to like something like that flat iron building, how it was in an in a interesting shape. So it is able to be displayed in a way that has a little bit of, of what people are used to be used to seeing. So looking at the inside, it's an all white marble hall. I mean, there's not so much that can be done with that. Um, but obviously, a lot of the impact is the redundancy in the white on white color scheme. So I you know, reenacted the scene of the first time that Harry came in and Hagrid was looking through all his pockets and obviously he has to present the key. Now, as you go back, the vaults are obviously not a visible part. So I wanted some sort of element that would convey the vaults being hidden and also cavernous. So when you open up these kind of back panels, you get a little bit of that um, without, again, taking up all that real estate within Diagon Alley itself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, talk about how you were able to achieve the desk design there because you've got pieces kind of on their side and stuff, and that's, that's really neat. Um, it's one of those things, honestly, it's like sometimes I don't even remember what I did. So it's just a little bit of basics not building. I mean, these are just plates. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit of a hinge brick, and then uh, they just have some stands that, that are able to make them tall as the figures. Yeah, but it works well to partition kind of the different desk areas there. Yeah, and I think that everyone who's been into a bank kind of knows that they always have those faux privacy barriers between each of the tellers <laughs> yeah. that nobody really abides by. Uh, but I, I wanted that bank feel somewhere in it. And again, with it being this gigantic marble hall, there wasn't much you could do uh, other than that. And so I also thought that the brown would break up some of the white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really nice. Thank you. And I was able to incorporate the new lantern somewhere in the build too. <laughs> Got to get all those cool new pieces in there. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Got to get some extra wands in there, some of the new legs and everything. I'm going to switch with you so I can lean over. All right, so moving along, we've got the Daily Prophet. Now, this is one that it is canon within Diagon Alley. You know, that has been addressed already. Obviously, Rita Skeeter making trouble out front, watching, gossiping, etc. Uh, in the movies and in the books, it's not really referenced a lot about the Daily Prophet. Uh, 
I like to attribute that to, hey, he's a kid shopping for school. What does he care where newspapers are made? Um, but, you know, if you look it up at Pottermore and things like that, uh, and as they're discussing the propaganda and later on in the series, there is a reference to the fact that the Daily Prophet is based in uh, Diagon Alley. This is another decal that we've made. Try to keep a lot of that very imposing, traditional, you know, newspaper building feel, a little bit of Georgian architecture. And this is one that I, I almost made more for adults in terms of the looks, because when you open it, it has a lot of uh, elements where it looks better when it's open. You kind of create a, a more imposing version of the building. So I wanted to make sure that not only did it look nice when it was closed, but when it was open, similar to how the original Diagon Alley set, Gringotts was able to be opened and it was a bigger building. The roof panels would flip up. I wanted to get incorporate as many of those details, those movement pieces that you would see in a, in a traditional Lego set. I like the skylights there as well, with those rounded uh, kind of panels there. Yeah, you know, this is a great thing about Lego. You work with what you have, and sometimes it's nice to be able to get something random. I actually made a parts order from Lego, and they sent me these accidentally. So <laughs> not only did I call them back, they said, keep the part. We'll send you the new one, you know, as Lego customer service. They're always on point. They're amazing. So I had these pieces, and I figured let's try to use them somehow. And I think every A fall, every builder in some way, experience where they suddenly have a piece, and they don't really know what to do with it, and hey, let's try to find a reason. So this is how I use that. And then we have the Big Ben facade for the clock. So mm -hmm. inside, now, this is not normally here, but I kept pulling it out throughout the day. It's normally in the editor's office. We've got a bar cart here for our fire whiskey. I just figure, you know, the editor of a newspaper, a lot of writers and things like that, uh, you know, I am not supporting alcoholism or drinking to get your job done, but it's a stereotype that uh, I wanted to kind of incorporate as a, you know, nice whiskey after a long day of writing. So that's normally up, up in the editor's office. Some of these items have been taken out throughout the day just to let people have a better view. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things, again, it's a very similar chandelier design. Want to incorporate a waiting room, some nice basic, you know, pictures on the wall. And then we've got a nice little hanging clock to help you with your time and your deadlines. I think it's so essential to make sure that, you know, got to get to the printer on time. And then up in the attic area, you've got some owls. Obviously, a lot of people deliver their they get their daily profit delivered by owls, so I, I thought that it was important to have a couple little little owls on there and stand by. And that chain railing detail is, is really neat as well. Uh, thank you. It's uh, very uh, unstable, and I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> it looks like it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, every time you need to get in anywhere, it pops out. So it's hard to get the lengths right, but, you know, in something like this, it's there's not much going on here in terms of playing or moving or something like that. So I, I don't think that it detracts from the build so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Now we've got Ollivanders. Uh, Ollivanders obviously is one of the ones that is most memorable in terms of people's just experiences, whether it's from the books or the movies or anything like that. Um, I think that this build is is the best example of incorporating different inspirations, whether it's from the book, your own imagination, or Universal, or the previous Lego sets. So with this one, obviously Ollivanders is described. It's at the end of the the alley. It's a little bit of a dingier shop, uh, but it's not. It's not still classy. I mean, the man is professional. He's been doing this a while. Uh, so it's very important that it doesn't look trashy or something like that. But I wanted it to be next to the Daily Prophet and Gringotts. Not only is it the end of the alley, but those are much bigger buildings. So putting it at the end like that, even though it's comparable in size to something like Flourish and Blotts or the Quidditch store, it looks a lot smaller by comparison. And you're able to give that feeling when you're viewing Diagon Alley as a whole without sacrificing the look and aesthetic that's required. Mm -hmm. So I basically wanted to do these rounded windows. These are the windows that are seen both in the, like, the movie as well as the Universal 
uh, store in, I guess it's in a couple locations, so I can't just say Florida, but that's the one I've been to. Uh, this had a little bit of snot building challenges. It definitely helped. I can't take credit for this. There were a lot of late, late night uh, text messages and things like that for, from not only my sister, but also my lug mate Grayson. He was really helpful in terms of answering questions. And oh, this is great. What about this? What about that? Um, so I, I really wanted to do these rounded windows. And that was the first part that I built with this. Now, the middle section ended up being two studs wide, but height. Obviously, with your, when you're working with Lego, you have the challenge of it not being perfectly square and cubed, so you've got to deal with that height when you're doing any sort of snot building. I originally had my design to be similar to the top layer, where it was just one, but it just didn't work out because, uh, as most people know, two studs wide is five plates high. So if you want to do one stud wide snot building, you can't really without leaving some sort of gap and I, I just really it's too small of a build to have that good thing about this sacrifice is that it ended up leaving me a little bit more real estate in terms of signage so i was able to put olivanders on there and in the movie and in the book it says makers of fine wands since 382 bc obviously i was just was not able to fit that on there but i figured this since 382 bc was i guess the better of the two. I figure most people know that's a wand shop. Mm -hmm. I wanted the kind of staggering book or the staggering boxes in the window of all the wands. Definitely had a cluttered feel in, in all of the source material, but I did want a couple of wands on display on the first floor as well. Color-wise, this one is a lot of inspiration from the original. I keep saying original, not the original. We just, we all choose to not remember that, that 2000s time. Uh, the 2011 Diagon Alley used this color scheme. So you've got that navy, you've got the sand green, tan, and then the dark tan with the gold accents. So a lot of the color scheme came from that. So this is a, a perfect blend, I think, of getting a little bit of inspiration from different parts of the Harry Potter fandom, be it the Lego movies, books, what have you. So looking inside, Again, I think you know one of the, the biggest parts of this build was to have those towering shelves. So in terms of the build order, it was those windows were built first, and then I went ahead and did the, the shelves. I really wanted to get those hodgepodge boxes of wands and, and in, in position, you know, you walk in, it's like, oh my goodness, these are all the wands. He's got so much work to do. And you know, half of the magic is, hey, this is how wands are selected. It, it seems overwhelming, but really it's not. Yeah, and then all those little one-by-one -one tiles make for really great just little boxes stacked in there all haphazardly. Yeah, and I think this is a good example of, of how a lot of A-Falls build where an individual element, you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, a tile is going to look like a box. But when you make the, the build and you actually kind of create a feeling and an idea and when all of these things are combined, you actually are able to give uh, an impression that maybe that individual element wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And I think in a nutshell, that's kind of building with Lego. Yeah, that turned out really nice there with the giant the giant shelves and everything. Thank you. So, as much grief as we've given, I did grow up with the original 2001 line. Uh, the uh, amazingly intricate castle that was basically like 20 pieces slapped together, if everyone knows it that. It was the early 2000s. I think that was everything that Lego was doing. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, studs, leave them all exposed. So, um... Here's my kind of homage to that. Like, let's not, let's not deny where we came from, even though we've gotten better, right? So if you look on the inside, it's very hard to see, but I can't, I can't open this one, but I use the original cardboard backing as the background for this. So I wanted, not only did I have the, the, ba you know, the backing still alive, I don't know how it lived through the attic uh, for that many years, I put as many windows in this building as possible so that as much light could get in and you could actually see it. But I put that in there for the adults and the people who kind of grew up with it, like me, and, and remember the, the old days of Lego. Is, you know, and, and that's why we do this, and that's why a lot of people do love Harry Potter. You know, it reminds them of when they read the books, however long ago that was. Mm -hmm. Now, for Diagon Alley, obviously, looking around, you've got so much happening. You've got a lot of people talking, shopping, buying, whatever it is. And then as you can go through, 
there's obviously alternate shopping options. So you get into Nocturne Alley. Now, Nocturne Alley, it's only really referenced a couple times. Uh, obviously, Borgen & Burks is the biggest shop that people know. All the other shops I didn't do interiors for because, I mean, nobody really ever goes in there. You just see the shop windows. And at the end of the day, you know, you only have so much time and pieces and everything, so you've got to kind of pick and choose on what right. you're going to do. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, limiting, you know, I build on a smaller scale generally. So building something smaller that has a little bit of an impact is going to make a bigger deal to somebody than overstretching, and then you lose that impact from the things that people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. So originally when I had an idea of how I was going to lay out Diagon Alley, like we said, in terms of the, the sight lines, Nocturne Alley was going to be behind it. What that meant was, originally this was built to be on the muggle side of things. I didn't have time to rebuild it once I changed it out, so I just left it on the back. But that was kind of the original plan slash alternate way of doing mm -hmm. things. So opening this up, let's take him out. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> lots going on in this one. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of a dark items. You know, it, it, it was a little bit overwhelming. So when Harry ends up here, he uses the flu network, which is a series of connections between fireplaces. And he gets soot in his mouth, and he coughs, and he coughs. And then he says Diagon Alley, but he doesn't say it right. So he ends up getting out at the wrong fireplace. I really wanted to keep as many of these elements as just like with the moving brick wall as possible, where you get a lot of the storytelling and you get that kind of magic. I mean, Lego is really known for incorporating play elements and surprise features, and I, I, I definitely wanted to do that. So on this back door, Harry is able to come in through the flu network, and that's how he ends up. So when he gets in, he sees all these items and artifacts, and obviously you have the Malfoy shopping, and what I would do is, when I say I draw inspiration from the book, I think it's really essential that it's not only what happens when they first meet the shop, but you know when they come back to it later. So we've got the vanishing cabinet, we've got the necklace, which appears later on in the series, and it's a fairly important item, but you don't know that initially. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I do, I actually will go through, and I have my very well-loved Harry Potter, <laughs> And I'll have people identify items that are actually referenced in the book. So if you're looking at the shop, the first time Harry ends up there, it's a glass case nearby held a withered hand on a cushion, a blood-stained pack of cards, and a staring glass eye. Evil-looking masks stare down from the walls. An assortment of human bones lay upon the counter, and rusty spiked instruments hung from the ceiling. So. I wanted to really incorporate that. I mean, it was a paragraph that literally just listed all of these items. So, right. And it's great because when you are displaying it and when you're able to see both kids and adults, you're, you can just read that to them and they can try to find it. And it, it really immerses them back in that world that they love. And, and you know, that's, that's why people are fans. It brings them happiness and, and they really want to make sure that it's true whenever possible. I think, is that an Islander's mask on the back wall yeah. there at the top? I love that. <laughs> so, and that's, that's been another great thing to see how different A-Falls and kids recognize certain other parts of, of Lego in it. And, you know, everybody has themes they like. And I just initially chose a bunch of random items, but I wanted to keep things like you'll see the old wizard scroll from some of the older series that I grew up with in terms of wizards. Additionally, you've got the back office room. And then up at the top, you know, I have a lug mate, and uh, one of her biggest display uh, draws is that she always has bad guys uh, doing sweet things. <laughs> and I think everyone's got a little bit of a soft side, and you never really know. And I think if uh, the Harry Potter uh, storyline has taught us anything, it's that don't judge a book by its cover. You know, somebody can be a bad guy, but you don't know what's going on. So he's got his teddy bear and his little friends posters on the wall, and just because he deals... Uh, in dark artifacts, that doesn't necessarily mean that he doesn't have a soft side as well. So those are cute little elements that people always uh, seem to gravitate towards because they're surprised and I think that it's nice and impactful, it makes people smile right. and then think so. It's a nice contrast with the darker hues of the rest of the build. Right, exactly. So that was um, just a random 
throw in there for both my lug mate as well as something that I think a lot of people like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Very nice. Yeah. That's pretty much it. I mean, the ice cream shop, I haven't finished the interior of, but uh, the, I think, what else is there? I think that's pretty much it. I try okay. to keep a lot of people bustling around. There's also, it, it'll say, it says Nocturnally on the other side of this, which I mean, if I move the Daily Profit, you probably can see it a little bit better. Additionally, you know, I wanted kids to be able to get sorted, so we have a nice little sorting hat here. If somebody wants to, you can just come up and spin it if you're not really sure what your house is. Now, I should have put it away earlier in the day because I had one point where a whole family came up and they said what house they were in, and it sorted perfectly, and I should have just retired it at that, honestly. <laughs> it reached peak levels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little out of juice. It's been a long day, so it might not get it right. But, yeah, I mean, you know, you just let kids and people just come up and spin it. Mm -hmm. And I am actually in Slytherin, so that's done. So, yeah. Awesome. And that's it. That's Diagon Alley, hopefully to be expanded upon, but we'll see. Yeah. Well, this, what you have here is just amazing. I mean, the, the outside of the buildings are great, but then, yeah, once you open those up inside and you show all the different little parts you were able to include from the books and everything, it's just incredible. So I, I love that you were able to bring this all out. What was it like setting this up when, when you actually got here? How long did that process take? It didn't, I, I don't know, I think like most people I tend to set up in spurts. Okay. As you put things out, you see somebody across the way setting something up and you're like, ooh, I like that. And then you get distracted and then you see somebody, you know, your friend who you haven't seen since last year or somebody that you saw at another convention. So it's really hard to kind of calculate that. I think that it took longer only because I there was a lot of interest in it. So as I was setting it up, I was opening it and showing people and there was just a lot of excitement. I mean, this is this is why I do this. I love talking about Lego and Harry Potter. So I would just get excited when somebody was like, oh, it's Diagon Alley. And I'm, oh, it is Diagon Alley, let's talk about it. So that ended up being kind of a hiccup, just my excitement and other people's excitement. We spent a lot of time talking about it. So it was, doors were opening and I decided that I wanted to put this decal down. So the previous night I had an idea about writing on the tape in front of it. And then in the morning I was like, yeah, let's go ahead and put the decal down on the ground. So because I wanted to take the stanchions away, it is a smaller build. There's a lot of details you have to kind of get in there and, and see. I didn't want that stanchion to prevent people from experiencing it. As a result, I wanted to let people get closer and I thought it would be fun to have a little bit on the ground so that while they could get closer, they were a little bit more aware of their body. Mm -hmm. So there was something visually right. to say like, they oh, wait, knew they were getting close. I can get close, <laughs> but can I? There's a lot of white lines. I mean, humans are, you know, we're very instinctual. You see a line and you stop at it and then you invite them in. So you've got these little banners that have the verbiage that is actually on Gringotts. So the enter a stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure here or there. So basically I'm saying here, come on by, don't touch though. <laughs> so I've got that um, and a lot of people were able to appreciate it having read the books, especially with all the uh, spoiler alert, that's why they were asking about the dragon on Gringotts. That's one of those things that uh, was around to prevent any theft. And handwritten in the front, I have, you can come closer, but uh, I, I let them know that there is a particular charm on all the items, and that's the charm that is used in one of the vaults, so that if you touch an item you don't own, it, uh, it burns you. Mm -hmm. Again, in parentheses, I said, for you muggles, this means do not touch. Unfortunately, it is also a charm that multiplies things. So I did get quite a few smart wizards out there who were like, well, if I touch your leg, it'll multiply, so are you sure you don't want me to? Uh, and that's how I was able to kind of identify some of the true fans out there. The people who knew what they were talking yeah, about. Yeah. Right, you're a wizard. You can come closer. It's fine. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking us through all those details. That's just incredible. And I know you've been interacting with the public all day, so I really appreciate you sticking out with us and taking the time to show all of this here because this is really amazing. So thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you guys as always. Always good to see you. And I'm, I'm sorry if I'm losing my voice a little bit. You know, it's been a lot of excitement today. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, people are loving the build. I was looking at the crowd around here earlier. You're even nominated for a best train slash town building uh, trophy there. So I think everyone's loving it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you as always.